Cause like a winter you are around the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the world of Austrian economics. That's right. With us today is Dr. Mark Skousen. He is the author of A Viennese Waltz, a wonderful book. And here is Dr. Mark Skousen. He's a financial economist, professor, and author with more than 40 years experience on Wall Street. He has also been an economic analyst for the CIA. He's the editor of his own website, www.mskousen.com. He has also written for the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the Christian Science Monitor. He has made regular appearances on CNBC's Cudlow & Company and C-SPAN Book TV. He currently is a presidential fellow at Chapman University, where he teaches economics and business. Let's welcome him to the circle. Welcome, Dr. Skousen. Carlos, it's good to be here. This is a great book. I love this a lot. Austrian economics. I like the cover. Isn't this fascinating? Isn't that a great book? Oh, you guys saw it a minute ago. Dancing down Wall Street. <laughs> the bull and the bear dancing. Yeah, they, they do dance a lot lately, that's for sure. So I guess the first premise I like to start off with is what is Austrian School of Economics? Well, there are several schools of economics. You know, there's the Keynesian School, followers of John Maynard Keynes, the Marxist School, followers of Karl Marx. And there is the Chicago School of Economics, the followers of Milton Friedman. So the Austrian School is a school of economics that got started in the University of Vienna at the turn of the 19th century. And it was founded by Karl Menger, and it's gone through a number of generations. The most famous e Austrian economists are Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. Hayek won the Nobel Prize in 1974, which kind of jump-started an interest in Austrian economics. So it all came out of the University of Vienna, and basically it's a school of economics that is very free market oriented, very focused on microeconomics, the theory of the firm, individual behavior, uh, subjective analysis, uh, and really started the, the marginalist revolution that, that began in economics was, was uh, developed by Karl Menger, the founder. Uh, very much a believer in the gold standard, sound money, free banking, free trade, um, limited government, laissez-faire, uh, that kind of school of economics. So it's in the same camp as the Chicago School of Economics, except probably uh, more extreme in terms of its defense of uh, libertarian economics. So it's heavily intertwined with political ideology. Well, it does have implications on, on political philosophy, that's for sure. Definitely a laissez-faire, limited government uh, approach. Uh, there are some anarchists also. Uh, Murray Rothbard is probably the leader of the anarchist capitalist movement in the Austrian school. But traditionally, Menger, uh, Bombarvik, uh, Schumpeter, Mises, and Hayek, all of them were limited government uh, laissez-faire believers. So let's say um, resurrections were possible. Mr. Von Mises was sitting here with us today. Would he uh, agree with the policies that are being implemented today? Well, his biggest uh, beef would probably be the, the degree of, of intervention in the monetary sphere. Uh, he wrote The Theory of Money and Credit. He's responsible for helping to establish the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And his basic view is that... Uh, inflation is never neutral, that it affects the economy in different ways and can create asset bubbles. The Austrian school is one of the few schools of economics that focuses on the destabilizing nature of a monetary inflation that is engineered by central banks. So they tend to be anti-central bank, more believers in the gold standard, and there's no free lunch in the monetary sphere when it comes to money that there's always um, structural imbalances that are caused by this. They tend to be rather pessimistic from a psychology point of view. Uh, most Austrians think that uh, things are going to end badly, that this inflation uh, by the Federal Reserve uh, can work in the short term, but in the long ter term is going to be a disaster, uh, resulting mm -hmm. in another recession, a depression, 
a bear market on Wall Street. So they're always looking uh, uh, behind their back. The th things are going well now. You have an economic recovery. But any second now, the economy could fall apart. The banking system could fall apart. Uh, uh, bull markets could turn into bear markets uh, and so forth. So there, there, is a, there is a degree of pessimism that you see with the Austrian school. Not entirely. I'm, I tend to be more optimistic, but I'm an exception to the rule. Actually, Both Mises and Hayek were very pessimistic about the future of the world. Well, in your opinion, and because uh, and you've, you've taught economics for 40 years, you said, so you must have started like a 15, but aside well. from that, um, <laughs> What do you think right now? I mean, there's, a, there's an argument of we have this un, 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 amazing amount of debt out there where we got the zero interest rates. Do you think this does portend for a bad future or well, does it really matter? Certainly if interest rates rise, it could portend a serious problem. Interest rates are so low now that the government's able to finance these deficits quite readily. And Rothbard was very good on this, by the way, who, who said... Uh, conservatives and free market types have always kind of overplayed their pessimism about the ability of government to finance deficits. And basically, if you can pay the interest, if you have enough assets and income tax liability sufficient to, um, to fund the deficit, then you're not going to have a problem. And it's amazing how long uh, since... World War II, how we've, uh, like you say, we've piled up debt after debt. In fact, during the Obama administration, they've added more debt than we have in the entire history of the United States. And yet, interest rates continue to be quite low, and we're able to finance them pretty readily. And that's because interest rates are historically at absolutely low levels. And you, can, you can issue uh, short-term securities and pay less than 1%. 10-year rate is under 2%. The 30-year is under 3%. So that's pretty cheap financing. And that 10 years has been a yo-yo a little bit in the last six months to a year. We've seen it go up to well, 2.6, 2.5, and then drop down to 1.5. I think last year in January's forecast of 2014, a lot of the companies came out. We're going to hit three at the end of the year. And a few months later, <laughs> I got yeah. slapped and it went down to 1.5. Well, none, none of us have been very good at predicting interest rate movements, that's yeah. for sure. It's a very difficult task. Is that because of the over-involvement of the government, which is kind of contradictory to the Austrian economics theory? Uh, but it's not just the government. It's also prices, uh, price indexes, which have been relatively low. Uh so there's market forces, the bond traders, uh, there, there are a lot of people involved in this uh, mixture of, of, uh, of financing of the debt. I was looking for a simple answer. I guess I won't be able to get one. <laughs> so here's a question I have for you. On the Austrian economic theme, we hear a lot of politicians will use that. Because I think a lot of the words resonate well with certain ideologies, like you were saying. Limited government. We don't need a central bank. But can a government like ours today... Can it really truly implement the Austrian economic theory? Well, I don't know any politician who says we can't do it without a central bank. They all seem to be in favor of a central bank. Now, they want to audit the Fed. They want to, to uh, limit what they can do. And they're against the bailouts and stuff like that. But every country today has a central bank of one sort or another. Now, you do have uh, currency boards on some cases, or they dollarize where they become, they don't have a central bank anymore. They just rely on the central bank of the United States. Um, you do have certain statements, for example, Bill Clinton said in the mid-90s that uh, the era of big government is over. Of course, uh, that was a little premature, to say the <laughs> least. Yes. And yes, you do have... Uh, politicians constantly extolling the virtues of the free enterprise system. They don't actually use the word capitalism. It seems to be a negative word for whatever reason. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they extol the virtues of limited government. They talk about tax cuts and that sort of thing. But then when you look at the reality, the reality is they, they never cut taxes very much. And if any, they find excuses all the time to raise taxes. Um, 
and government becomes more and more uh, a bigger, more evasive, uh, invasive. And so I don't think the talk and the walk are moving in the same direction. Now, that's for sure. So one of the politicians that pops up in my mind is Ron Paul. Is he really uh, an Austrian economic kind of guy? Ron Paul is, yes. yes. Ron Paul is the true believer and he was known as Dr. No in Congress. He voted against <laughs> legislation time and time again, although his wife said it's Dr. No, K-N-O-W. Uh, so that's the uh, difference there. But still, yeah, no, he's a true believer. I've known Ron Paul for many years. He's a follower of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, which is very uh, Austrian in their approach. His son, Rand Paul, is probably not as much of a true believer. I'm not sure he uses the uh, terms of Austrian economics that much. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't recall any of those. Um, one of the arguments I did hear about it, and I, I would definitely want to get to another subject. There's a wonderful thing coming up that you're a part of called the Freedom Fest, and we'll get to that in a second. Definitely want to look into this. But one of the things I want to talk about, some people say that the gold standard and some of these philosophies in Austrian economics can actually limit growth because you don't have the ability to quantitative ease. You don't have the ability for a, a credit what, what do you think about that? Well, there's certainly room for credit uh, because that's a relationship that, that the banks can do in, in loaning money, borrowing money. That's going to be very much a part of any kind of a gold standard. Uh, what the gold standard does is provide a very uh, tough discipline on the government in terms of expansion of the money supply itself. And that's um, there's no question about it that if you limit the increase in the money supply to the amount of gold that is discovered for monetary purposes, you're going to see an increase in the money supply of only 1% to 2%. Even during the gold rush era of the uh, California gold rush, uh, money supply increased at 4% per year, 5% at the most. And, but under normal circumstances, only 1% to 2%. If you have flexible prices, that's not going to be a problem. But when you have sticky wages and sticky prices and so forth, it could be a problem. And, and that's one reason that the, we've moved away from the gold standard and moved toward more of a, uh, a flexible fiat money standard where we limit the expansion of the money supply, the fiat money supply. Uh, but that has its own um, weaknesses uh, because it does create a boom-bust cycle and, and uh, it cr creates bull and bear markets and, and a lot of malinvestment. And that's what the warning is from the Austrians in that regard. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Now, the, when they did this, when they created the theory, obviously it was, it was about 100 50 years ago, years Well, the Austrian years? theory and the business cycle really started in 1912 well, with the theory ago. of money and credit. So that's 100 years ago. Does the theory work with the level of international trade that we do? I mean, the, internet, the economy nowadays is completely different than it was 100 years ago. Everybody's yeah. so intertwined, interconnected. China's a huge player in the whole game. Does it still fit? Does it still work? Well, there was a feeling that it didn't work for a long time, but then when the asset bubble was created in real estate and it had this macroeconomic global impact, 
then everybody paid attention saying, oh, is there a theory that can explain asset bubbles? And the Austrian school was very good at that. So there's been a lot more interest uh, in that. But uh, it, a global economy can make changes so that the, the government can get away or the Federal Reserve can get away with uh, expanding the money supply for a much longer period of time <clears throat> because of the global nature of the economy. The dollars are exported. We have a world currency. The dollar is a world's currency. It's king dollar. And so that has allowed us in the United States to, uh, to engage in inflation for much longer periods of time, as opposed to the period when we were on the gold standard, when, uh, as Ludwig von Mises said, you can't inflate for very long because it comes back to haunt you. Now we can inflate for long periods of time and get away with it. Interesting. Fascinating. Way ahead of its time, there's the book again, A Viennese Waltz You Must Get. We're going to travel over to the Freedom Fest. So let's find out what that's all about. What is the Freedom Fest? So Freedom Fest is a conference that uh, we meet in Las Vegas. Every It's the most libertarian city, entertainment <laughs> capital of the world, and we have an intellectual feast. So we talk philosophy, science and technology, history, geopolitics, art and literature, music and dance, healthy living. It's a little bit of everything. And we have over 100 speakers, we have over 100 exhibitors, and we have several thousand people who gather. We call it the world's largest gathering of free minds. And Steve Forbes and John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Markets, are our co-ambassadors. This year, our big event is our dream debate. Our theme is the American dream. Uh, discovering the new American dream is our theme. And our dream debate is Paul Krugman versus Steve Moore. So we have the oh. number one Keynesian versus the number one supply sider, number one New York Times columnist against the number one Wall Street Journal columnist. So it's really creating a lot of buzz. We have over 100 people already signed up. We'll, we'll probably sell out this year. It's July 8th through the 11th. Just think 7-Eleven in Vegas at Planet Hollywood. We take over the entire hotel and it is a blast. I mean, people, there's a lot of buzz about our conference because we we do so much. We have debates. We have a mock trial. We're putting the Federal Reserve on trial, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. So we have a judge, prosecuting, defending attorney, star witnesses. <laughs> we have a jury vote and stuff like that. It really is a lot of fun. Is Bernanke going to be there? Um, well, no. We'd <laughs> like to have him call him to the stand. That would be great. Oh, yes. But he's too expensive. So we have some... <laughs> We have some supporters. We're trying to get Paul Krugman. He, he could defend the Fed, perhaps, but who knows? Uh, it's it's really going to be a lot of fun. That sounds like a blast. Krugman yeah. and, and uh, Stephen Moore. <laughs> That's yeah. going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, it took me eight years to get uh, Krug years. Krugman and Moore together to, to come up with this uh, debate. So wow. we're pretty excited about it. They've never debated before, so it should be a lot of fun. Never on Cudlow? Nope. No, oh, you, can never, you can never get them together. Yeah, it was always Robert Reich <laughs> and right. Steve Moore. Yeah, <laughs> They were always duking it out. So I know something we talked about off camera. You said about the American dream, but then you hit the sweet spot for the show. You hit Freud. <laughs> well, yeah, Freud <laughs> in 1900 wrote this extremely influential book called The Interpretation of Dreams. And we thought with our theme of the American dream, why not have some sessions on the influence of Freud. You know, Freudian psychology has had a tremendous impart, Im, uh, impact on our culture. And so I think it's really valuable to see how far along uh, has Freud been discredited? Uh, how important is our, our, our interpretation of dreams and, and our youthful experiences? To what extent will that have an impact? Uh, in in what we're doing in the world, so it, it I think it'll be a fun event. So we have uh, we have some top experts coming in on the interpretation of dreams. When I first checked on this, I only could get astrologers and people who, <laughs> who, who you know read your palm and stuff like that. But we actually found a number of top academics who do studies on dream interpretation as well as a wow. uh, discussion of Freud in, in culture and, and uh, literature and that sort of thing, and in psychiatry, you know, because Freud is still used in psychiatry, the, yeah. you know, the sofa bed and all that sort of thing, <laughs> looking at your past to see what may have influenced you to do uh, what, you, what you've done. So 
we're excited about having a Freudian uh, discussion at Freedom Fest. And yeah. these are some of the, this is the exciting thing about Freedom Fest. We do stuff that you just don't get at other conferences. Sounds like yeah. it. And the interesting things, I was having a conversation, oh, I think it was about a couple of weeks ago with, with a behavioral economist. And uh, we were talking about how prevalent Freud is becoming again in the world of economics. Uh, marketing, they have neuromarketing now, how to access the unconscious mind. Uh, they talk about risk aversion. You know, it could come down from your father or your mother and how they handled money can affect you. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of variables there that we saw. And it's like, wow, Freud is starting to come back. He's popping yeah, his head I, I think there is uh, some elements of that. Of course, you know, he had an extremely negative view regarding uh, uh, money and, uh, you know, thought that it was dirty and that sort of thing and it has in, influenced uh, our culture a lot. Um Sex, of course, is a huge thing. We, as a matter of fact, have uh, um, we have an economist or an historian who's giving a whole talk about uh, Hugh Hefner, the Sexual Revolution, Playboy magazine, and the American Dream. Uh, so we're we're talking about that too, and we're also talking about Dale Carnegie, his influence, oh, yeah. uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Brooker T. Washington, all of these people. Uh, uh, had a deep influence on the American psyche about self-help books and all that sort of thing. That's all part of the American dream, even today. Now, we have noticed, though, there's a secular decline in home ownership. People are more interested in renting now than they are in owning a home. Owning a home is not as the American dream like it used to be. Uh, and the number of people who own homes is con continues to be on the decline. Debt, that's a serious problem. Uh, getting, a, getting a fulfilling job, retirement, do you have enough money for retirement? We're going to discuss all of those issues on discovering the new American dream and can you achieve the American dream like everyone talks about. I live the American dream. And uh, can you still do that? That's a big question, Mark. It's a very big question. And a lot of people don't realize that economics is not just about numbers. It takes a lot into consideration human behavior. Because you were saying buying the homes, not buying the homes. Now that's changing behavior again. It's almost like a group think going yeah. on. Um, so psychology has a big, big component in the world of economics. I think it's a fabulous conference. Circle of Insight would love to be there at the Freedom Fest. Hopefully we'll see you there as well. We're going to get some more information. But before we do that, we have a couple more questions for Dr. Skousen before we let him go. Um, some people have asked me, well, we got this Austrian economic theory. It seems to be really insightful has an ability to look at things and it kind of predicted what could happen in 2008, I guess, kind of give a little, if you do this and this, this is what's going to happen according to Austrian economics. But do the Austrians follow it? Well, it is hard <laughs> to, uh, it's, you know, Mises himself said that uh, even, even though we talk about uh, predicting the top of markets or the economy reaching a pinnacle and then going into recession, Timing is everything, as you know, in making money in the markets. And if you're too early, you miss out on the continuation of the boom. If you're too late, you can lose your shirt uh, uh, seeing your assets drop in value. And uh, Austrians uh, being, tend to be perma bears. They tend to just constantly. So they're really great at predicting the 2008 crisis. But they were predicting it in 2007, 2006, 2005. Wow. And, and so that's, it really isn't that helpful. In fact, Mises himself predicted the 2930 Great Depression. No question about that. But he started, the, la the earliest we see was 1926, saying uh, it was time to, the markets are in a dangerous position. So you can leave a lot of money on the table by this, this type of thing. Now, I think the, the uh, one thing that the Austrians do, they look at the structure of the economy. I wrote a book called The Structure of Production, but it applies in all areas, the structure of employment, the structure of interest rates. So you don't want to look at just one interest rate. Look at the yield curve. See what the short-term rates are doing with the long-term rates. And interestingly, er, almost every time you've had an inverted yield curve where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, that's the sign of a bear market, that's a sign of an economic recession taking place. And sure enough, in the year 2000 and 2007, we had an inverted yield curve. Not by a lot, but there was a inverted yield curve. 
uh, predicting these things. So that's one of the things I talk about in the Viennese Waltz down Wall Street, that maybe you can use the yield curve as an indicator of trouble ahead. Are we seeing any? And, and right now, it's a positive yield curve, and that's yeah. why I tend to be bullish still. It's amazing. We've had a long run. Yeah, we have five, six years of a bull market and economic recovery. But it has wow. been a gradual recovery. It has not been a overly inflationary boom type of recovery. So it may be able to last longer than people expect. And that's an interesting comment for the last question here. I, I got one more question, but uh, second to the last question. It seems that the market, shoom, the last five, six years, the economy, eh. yeah. So there's a disconnect here that seems like from psychology. People are viewing the economy a certain way than it really is. What's going on there? Well, Wall Street and Main Street are the same over the long term. I've got a number of charts that show real GDP and the S&P 500. They kind of go back and forth, but they end at the same over a 20, 30 year period. Um, it's kind of like a rocky marriage. You're, you're separated from time to time, but you never get a divorce. That's what what we're seeing. So yeah, they do get separated. And in the case, in this case, uh, one of the things that Mises always asks is who gets the money first? So you've had these easy money policies, you've had these bailouts and who got that money? Wall Street got that money. And so Wall Street is doing better than the rest of the economy right now, but it can't last forever. At some point, they're going to have to come back together. Interesting. Last question. Does Austria itself Use Austrian economics? No, no. The the, really? the University of Vienna does not have an Austrian economist right now in there. They have economists who are Austrian, but they're not of the Austrian <laughs> school of economics of Mises and Hayek. They tend to be standard neoclassical Keynesian economists. It's, it's kind of sad. Now there are some think tanks there that are promoting Austrian economics and having conferences there, but it's not part of the university and it's not part of the Austrian government. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Skousen, again for coming My on. pleasure. Where do we go for Freedom Fest one more time? Freedomfest.com, July 8th through the 11th. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. Just go to the website and get more information. Fantastic. Here's the book one more time. A Viennese Waltz, Down Wall Street, Austrian Economics for Investors. A must get as well. I hope to see you at the Freedom Fest. Remember, wherever there's psychology involved, even in the world of Austrian economics, we're there. See you next time, everyone.